Today we're going to go a little bit off the beaten path and I'm going to show you how to make wine from lemon juice. Whenever you're making a unique wine like this where you're kind of adding some water to this um, unconventional fruit concentrate or maybe you're using, I don't know, some wild fruits that you've picked in the woods, this is going to be called a country wine as opposed to your traditional red wines where they're made from grapes. Now these country wines are a really great way to get started in winemaking because you can make some pretty tasty stuff and it does not cost a lot of money. You can experiment a lot and you can really just learn a lot by doing this. Now I was looking back in my one of my wine books here and back in 2015 I made a lemon wine like this. It's called Skeeter P. And this is not new to the wine world. A lot of people have done this stuff. And I was actually really pleased with how that wine turned out. It's basically like a hard lemonade. You can mix it with um, iced tea. You can kind of make a Arnold Palmer type thing. It's just a fun thing and it does not cost hardly anything. You can have six gallons of wine, which is 30 bottles for under $20 if you do this. So I found one of those bottles on the shelf, dusty old bottle, and I'm just going to open it up and see if it survived the test of time. So if you pour an old bottle of wine like this, there's going to be a couple things you're going to look for. You're going to look at the color, and if it's off color, so say it's a little bit brown, that's an indication that maybe things are starting to go downhill on that wine. But the other thing that you're really going to do is you're going to smell it. So you're going to smell for things like nail polish remover smell, which is ethyl acetate. So that happens when um, ethanol and acetic acid form ethyl acetate, which is pretty, it's not really dangerous bad, but it'll definitely ruin the wine. The other thing you can smell for is vinegar, which is acetic acid, it smells like a jar of pickles. And the third thing you can smell for is acetaldehyde, which is going to kind of smell nutty like sherry. And I'm not smelling any of those things in this wine, which is good, and it's really not that unexpected because this lemon wine that I made had a pH of about 3.2, which is relatively safe. and. Um, it was properly sulfited. So you can e easily expect to get five years out of a wine like this. Now we're going to take a sip and see if it hangs. I'd say it's still pretty tasty. I think that would still be a crowd pleaser today. Now if you want to make a lemon wine like this, I'm going to tell you exactly what you need. And you can kind of follow along in this video. I'm going to show you front to end start to bottling so you don't have to go through part one, part two, part three. We'll make it nice and easy for you. I've got three quarts of lemon juice from Concentrate. This is Bellevue brand, but you can get whatever brand you can find. The yeast I'm going to use is probably the most popular wine yeast for home winemakers. It's Lauvin EC1118 and you can get this at any home brew shop or I'll put a link where you can buy this online. You can find that in the video description. You're going to need a 10 pound bag of table sugar and you're going to use this whole thing. You may even want to have a little bit of extra sugar and we'll talk about that later. Um, you're going to want some yeast nutrient. This is just diammonium phosphate, just basic yeast nutrient. And you can use more complex nutrients, but in this video I really want to keep this super simple. I'm not going to make it too crazy and if you want to start to embellish on it, feel free. Check out some of my other videos and you can try to get a little creative with this particular wine. I'm going to use a little bit of tannin. This is FT Rouge. It's just what I had in my closet and it'll work fine, but just any wine tannin will work for this. Um, you're going to need a little bit of potassium metabisulfite or you can use Camden tablets which are basically tablet form of sulfite. And that's going to get you, make this wine last that five years if you want it to. Now if you're going to drink this wine within three, four months, you 
probably could go sulfite free. We're going to have a pretty healthy acid on this wine. Um, and then I've got some potassium sorbate. So you're only going to need this if you want to sweeten the wine at the end, which I probably would recommend doing. You're going to need a airlock. This is just a double bubble style airlock. These are my favorite. They work great and they're really cheap. And a bung. You're going to need a six gallon carboy. And I'm going to make six gallons. You can scale this down if you want. You can make one gallon. Just divide everything by six that I'm doing. And I'll mention that you probably should pick up some wine corks. These are Aquamark corks. These are by far, I think they're the best bang for the buck corks. And it's what I use in most all of my wines. So you'll notice in my carboy here, I'm about just under half full. And I filled with really, really hot water, the hottest water I can pour out of my faucet. But don't, like, don't pour boiling water. I don't want you to crack your carboy or anything. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to start pouring some ingredients into our wine or into our water here. One thing I didn't mention, but I will be using is I will be using some pectic enzyme. And that's not required. You don't need to do it, but it'll help assure that that wine is going to be crystal clear. It'll just present itself a little bit better. So you have this nice crystal clear wine. Sometimes you can get a bit of a pectin haze in a wine. Now I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to pour this sugar into here. And I'm going to use all 10 pounds. 10 pounds of sugar to 6 gallons is probably going to make about 18% sugar by weight. So in wine speak that's going to be 18 degrees bricks. To calculate potential alcohol Based on that number, you multiply by 0.57, and that's going to give us a wine that is around 10% alcohol. So I'm just pouring the sugar directly into the six gallon carboy here, and I'm just going to do a big swirl and try to over you know the next the span of this video or a little bit after just try to try to really get this sugar mostly dissolved normally what I would do is I would do invert sugar so you can kind of make a simple syrup um, you don't have to do that the yeast will invert the sugar on its own but it's just hard to get an accurate measurement if you're pouring granular sugar in like I am here. But in the spirit of our country wine video, we're going to keep this as easy as possible for you so you don't have to get too fancy. You can see our sugar's starting to dissolve, but it's certainly still a little bit granular in there. Before things really get started, we're just going to make sure there's no sugar piled up on the bottom of this thing. I'm going to go ahead and pour in my lemon juice. I shook these things up a little bit. There's just some kind of I don't know, lemon um, pulp at the bottom. And I, I really do want to get that all into the wine here. Now, if you want to get into winemaking, please click the little subscribe button on the bottom to subscribe to my channel. And then if you click the little bell, you'll be notified every time I put out a new winemaking video. You can also swing by my website, smartwinemaking.com. And of course, as always, if you have any questions, post in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them, try to help you along the way here. Now that the sugar is mostly dissolved, I'm going to go ahead and top up with cold 
water to bring the temperature back down to something reasonable, like under 100 degrees F. And I've left just a little bit of headspace in here. Because if you don't, it could really foam over the top on you, which you don't want that. And then I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to add my pectic enzyme. Like I said, this is an optional step, but it will help to assure that the wine's going to be a little bit more clear. Normally you use this in a wine where you have solid fruits also, just to help break down the fruits better, help to really extract from those fruits. So I'm going to swirl that in really good. I will mention wine and beer differ. So normally beer, you wouldn't want to touch anything like this with your hand because you could contaminate that beer. It's just really vulnerable to um, microbiological spoilage. Now wine is going to be way, way higher acid. It's also going to be way higher alcohol. It's really going to only have a small handful of bacteria that are going to cause you trouble. And we're going to take some measures just to make sure that they don't cause you trouble. So that's why you monitor the pH. That's why you add sulfites. Now, if you follow my recipe here, you shouldn't have to really measure with a pH meter. You should be pretty close. But if you do want to take it one step further, you're going to want to buy a pH meter and kind of start keeping track of that stuff. So you don't want to add tannin too soon after you've added your enzymes. You want to let those enzymes work a little bit because they can bind up with the tannin. You also don't want to add yeast because as that wine starts to generate alcohol, those tannin or those enzymes are going to become much less effective. So we're going to let the enzymes work for about five or six hours. Then we're going to come back and we're going to get that fermentation kicked off. It's been about six hours since we've added the pectic enzyme to this lemon wine, so that's plenty of time. I don't need any more than that. I've done some measurements on it in the meantime. So the pH is a little bit lower than I want it to be. It's about 2.6, which is very low, but it should climb a little bit. And for this lemon wine, we're treating it like a hard lemonade, so it's going to be good for that. And if you're making this on your own, your own feel welcome to shift the pH how you want by either adding less lemon juice, more water, however you want to do that. Um, we're just getting ready to add the yeast. So I've added some yeast nutrient. Now I wouldn't normally do that before the start of fermentation because with something like grapes, you could actually kick off some wild yeast that you might not want to get going. And the, with something like grapes, you're already going to have a good bit of nitrogen right in the, the grape must, which is what we call this juice or juice with grapes in that case. But I've added three teaspoons. I'm probably going to add another three teaspoons in a couple of days just to kind of keep that yeast fermenting happy. A stressed yeast is, yeast is really one of the biggest causes of wine issues, like bad off tastes and off smells in the wine. Now the yeast that we're going to use, I mentioned, is EC1118. And I made a nice yeast starter. So to make a yeast starter is very simple. You just take some warm water dump the packet of yeast in the water and let it sit for about 15 minutes until it starts to bubble just a little bit. From there you can add some of your juice to that, let it start to bubble a little bit more, add some more juice. Do that a couple times. It takes about, oh, about a half hour or so to make a good healthy yeast starter. That achieves a couple things. It allows you to really acclimate that yeast to the pH and the um, temperature of the, the juice that you're going to be putting it in. So it doesn't really shock it. And again, all part of just keeping that yeast happy and making sure you get a reliable start to your fermentation. The percent sugar in this wine is sitting at about 18, just a hair over 18.1, 18.2. And once we add our water, we're going to be just under. So in the mid 17s, mid to high 17s, that's going to be perfect for this lemon wine. Like I said, I want to sit around 10% alcohol. And that's where we're going to end up with, with those percent sugars or degrees bricks if you speak in winery terms. So what we're going to do now, this is about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. 
which I'm very happy with, especially with that low pH. I just want to make sure that that yeast has every advantage it, it can have to keep chugging along. So we're going to add this yeast starter to this wine or this juice. And I'm not really going to stir it in or anything. I'm just going to kind of let it sit on the top because it does like a little bit of air at this stage. A little air again helps keep the fermentation healthy. Later on, air can be your worst enemy, but it can be your friend at this stage. And that's really going to be it for day one of the wine. I'm just going to throw an air lock on it. You can throw like a paper towel over the top or a towel and generally I actually would recommend that because like I said it does like a little bit of air at this stage. Oftentimes I'll ferment in an open top bucket with a loose towel but this is a really forgiving wine. We're, this is going to be pretty easy as far as wines go. So we're just going to keep it simple. We're going to put an airlock on it. And you'll also be able to visibly tell if things are fermenting because you'll start to see the bubbles going. So now all I'm going to really do is keep it warm until I start to see fermentation started. So I'm going to take it upstairs. I'm going to put it next to a heater vent. Try to keep it sitting at around 80 degrees. Um, one note about that is I normally would ferment a, a kind of lighter, fruitier wine cold to trap and retain those aromas. Well, this is lemon juice. Lemon juice isn't really that volatile of an aroma. You can heat lemon juice up and still retain that lemony goodness. So I'm more focused on just successful fermentation here. So we'll check back on it in a couple days. With a really super low pH on this lemon wine, I did struggle to get the fermentation going. So I ended up adjusting the pH up with a little bit of calcium carbonate, which is basically a powdered form of chalk. I'll put a link to where you can buy that in the video description. Now you'll notice when I added that I did pull some wine out and mix the calcium carbonate with the wine that I pulled out. You don't really want to just pour it in as a powder or you could risk a wine volcano, which could happen to the best of us. Even if you've done this a million times, it's easy to get a little careless and cause a volcano, which I did end up accidentally doing when I later added the tannin that I mentioned. So I did add a little bit of tannin to give a little bit more mouthfeel to this wine, but being a little careless, I added directly to the wine, which caused a nucleation site for the CO2 that was dissolved in the wine during active fermentation caused a little bit of a volcano, a little bit of a mess, but in the end, not really too big a deal other than just a little bit of cleanup necessary. So here we are, the fermentation is complete and the wine is finally crystal clear. So the way you know the fermentation is complete is you're going to see it stop bubbling and you're going to want to check it with a hydrometer if you have one and just verify that the wine is dry. So you're going to see a number below 1.000 specific gravity and ultimately you're probably going to end up around 0.995 when it's fully settled out and you don't have so many dissolved solids in the wine anymore. My fermentation took a couple weeks to complete once we finally got it going, but it takes a little while to get a wine like this to clear. Every wine, every wine's a little bit different in how quickly it'll clear. You can accelerate the process with some fining agents, but I always like to let it naturally clear up. And like I said, total time took about four months with this wine. As you can see, I've got a lot of wines here. I can be patient. It's not that big a deal for me to wait. But if you're impatient, you can play around with your super clears and your fining agents. I just generally think they take out a little bit more from the wine than just the, the haziness. So I like to, to do it naturally. 
So what I'm going to do with this wine is two things. I'm going to make a wine for drinking young that I'm going to put into a small two and a half gallon keg. And that wine I'm going to back sweeten a little bit. So to back sweeten it, we're just going to add some invert sugar, which I've simmered on the stove, just some sugar, water, tiny bit of lemon juice to provide some acid, simmer for about 20 minutes. That'll invert the sucrose into glucose and fructose, which is what's, nat what's naturally going to happen in this wine due to the acid. So I just want to invert it before it goes in so that we're getting a good representation of what that sugar is going to taste like in the wine when we blend it. We're also going to add a little bit of potassium sorbate to the wine that we're going to sweeten. So we're first going to get it off the lees before we do that because these lees are little yeast cells. So they're going to just try to re-ferment if we don't get it off there. Even if we add the potassium sorbate, sorbate still going to try to re-ferment. Um, we're going to add a little bit of potassium metabisulfite. I'm going to add, just to make life simple, you can add about a quarter teaspoon to it. Um, our final pH was about 3.3. So realistically, I'm probably going to want to add about, if you want to get more scientific, mm, 25 or 30 parts per million, which is going to be about one to one and a half grams or actually a little bit under a quarter of a teaspoon. You can swing by my website again, smartwinemaking.com. I've got lots of articles going way in depth about the science of sulfites so you can kind of learn why you're adding them, how much to add. The, the other half of this wine I'm going to bottle to to age so we're going to probably drink that in say two to four years from now. I mentioned early, early in the video that that old lemon wine actually was really, really good. So that wine I'm going to bottle dry. For that portion that's going to be bottled dry, we don't need to add the potassium sorbate because there's no sugar, so we don't have risk of re-fermentation. We only have to add the potassium metabisulfite. For both of these, because they're being racked young, there's certainly some dissolved CO2 still in here. I could tell when I picked it up and moved it, some little bubbles are still jiggling out of it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to degas it with a, a wine degassing tool. The one I'm using is one that I made. I offer it on my website. It's all stainless steel. It goes on a cordless drill. Swing by there and check it out. But we'll go ahead and we'll get started. We're first going to just rack it, degas it, we'll bottle the dry wine, and then we'll back sweeten and put the back sweetened wine into a keg.
That's all for our lemon wine saga. I hope I provided more detail than maybe you might get in a more quick tutorial for this. What I really want to do is not only tell you how to make the wine, but why I'm doing each of the steps that I'm doing. Some things I may have left out are racking the wine. So when primary fermentation is over, typically you would rack the wine, meaning siphon it into another carboy. With a lemon wine like this with very low solids, it's a little bit more optional because you've only got, you know, say a quarter of an inch of settled out yeast and, you know, fruit cells at the bottom of that. So it's less likely to cause a problem. But normally what I'll do is I'll rack into another carboy and top up with a similar wine. Now this being a wine from Concentrate where I intentionally made it slightly over concentrated during fermentation, so I had a little air space, I could top up with water instead of wine. Um, so we've got two wines, which I always like when you're capable of doing that. We've got this wine intended for aging, which is our dry lemon wine. We'll probably open that in, I don't know, we'll open a bottle a year and see where that takes us. And then this is the crowd pleaser for right now which is our semi-sweet or sweet um, lemon wine in keg. And this tastes just like a, somewhere between like lemonade and lemoncello. It's a pretty, pretty tasty little drink. And for the cost, which like I said, per bottle is like well under a dollar, it's, you're not gonna find a better deal than this. If you have any comments, make sure to mention in the comments section if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Maybe some of my subscribers can help answer them. If you haven't yet subscribed, make sure to click subscribe in the bottom. And thanks for watching.